Hey, what's going on, savers and investors? I hope you're all having a great day as always. If you're new to the channel, then welcome. My name is Griffin, and in today's video, we're gonna be doing a full industry comparison of the top real estate investment trusts in Canada, putting them side to side and seeing how each one of them has fared during this extended period of the medical issue. After posting the RioCan Q2 earnings analysis video last week, I got a great response from that video, and a lot of people in the audience requested that I do the same sort of analysis for other REITs in Canada, so I just thought this would be an opportune moment Moment to do a revamped version of the full REIT industry comparison video that I had released a couple months back after Q1 earnings had been released. And now that pretty much all the Q2 earnings for all the REITs in Canada have been released, I decided to do the same sort of video and add a couple more that the audience had requested so that we really have a nice comprehensive view of what's going on in the REIT space in Canada. Now, I do want to mention that I have been speaking a fair bit about REITs recently on the channel, and that's because after conducting the poll on my community page requesting what type of content you all want to see. A lot of you said that you wanted to see dividend stocks and just by the nature of what a REIT is, these typically have a high dividend yield. But I have also been working on a variety of other industry comparison videos such as the bank industry, the cannabis industry, tech industry, and a couple of others. The thing is that with these types of videos though, where we're comparing a variety of different stocks, I need to make sure that each and every company has the release of the Q2 earnings. So I have a lot more content coming as well as some growth stock and undervalued stock content. So basically, I wish I could do more content, but each one of them takes a huge amount of time and research, but I will be getting around to as much content as possible that's been requested. So make sure to hit the bell button so that you're notified whenever I release a new piece of content. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. If you do, please take two seconds to drop a like on the video. It really helps the channel grow. And also, if you're still looking to open a brokerage account, make sure to check out one of the two links down below where you can open either a Quest Trade or Well Simple Trade account and get some free money for doing so. Okay, so with that said, in today's video, we're going to be jumping into an Excel spreadsheet where we're going to be comparing head to head eight of the top real estate investment trusts in Canada that all operate in various different facets of real estate so that we can get a broad and clear view of the industry as a whole. But in case you're new to investing and don't really know what a real estate investment trust is, let's just quickly cover what a real estate investment trust is in the first place. A real estate investment trust or REIT for short is a publicly traded company that happens to own and manage real estate as their primary business model and they need to derive at at least 75% of all this income from either rental revenue or the sale of property. A REIT is a financial security that you can buy and sell throughout the trading day on an exchange just like you would an ETF or a stock. However, unlike a typical company that sells products and services, a real estate investment trust is going to own and manage real estate and derives most of their income from rental revenue. And by holding real estate investment trust in your portfolio, you're able to easily include real estate in your overall portfolio and benefit from both appreciation and dividend income without having to actually physically hold real estate and deal with all the hassles that come with actually owning real estate, such as, for example, fixing foundations, fixing toilets, etc., and dealing with tenants. That's really all I'm going to cover in today's video for the quick recap of what a REIT is. If you want to learn more about them, make sure to check out the video I'm overlaying right here. Now, at the time of posting that first video comparing six top Canadian REITs back in March, we were still just entering the extended period of business shutdown. And at that point, there were still a lot Lot of unknowns surrounding the future of REITs and the viability of their dividend distributions, especially for retail focused REITs, because for a handful of these REITs, their tenants were in serious jeopardy of either closing their business down for an extended period of time or even permanently shutting down the business, which would have a huge impact on rent collection. This is because a REIT collects the rental income from tenants, pays all their expenses, and basically redistributes all of their earnings back to shareholders, being the primary reason why most REITs have a high dividend yield in comparison to other dividend stocks and also pays out these dividend distributions on a monthly basis. That said, if a REIT's main client base is focused primarily on retail, most of these tenants having seen extremely strenuous periods for at least a couple of months, even going as far as permanently shutting down their doors, this could translate very easily into defaults on rental payments, which would have a severe impact on the revenues of these real estate investment trusts. And this is really where the overall investor fear surrounding real estate investment trusts that came in back in March leading to extreme nosedives in the overall pricing of the REIT market in Canada. 
As we can see from this chart of the S&P TSX capped REIT index, the overall REIT sector in Canada is still tremendously lagging behind in contrast to the overall Canadian and American market, still down roughly 29% since February benchmarks, meaning the overall market is quite bearish on what's to come for REITs in the future, but is this justified based on the most up-to-date information that we now have on hand? And is it a good time to get in on some of these REIT prices being down dramatically with high yields as a result? This video is intended to really highlight how these companies have been impacted and whether or not rent collection is in jeopardy. Obviously, the financials of each company can vary greatly depending on the type of real estate that they operate, and some have been doing much better than others. So now that we're in the third quarter of the 2020 calendar year and have access to all the Q2 figures for these REITs, let's dive into the side-by-side -side comparison of these eight main REITs. All right, so here we are on the main Excel spreadsheet, and I know this looks like a lot of information because it is but not to worry we're going to be breaking down everything by category as well as by real estate investment trust listed up here so at the end of this video you're going to properly understand everything that we're looking at here from a data standpoint now this is in millions of dollars as of june 30th 2020 meaning we're looking at the data here for the second quarter meaning the months from april through to june i've decided to include eight main real estate investment trusts here divided up into categories of real estate kind of like what we did in the last time however i've also added two new ones, both of them being in the residential real estate because they were requested by audience members. So this is quite straightforward. The upper section right here basically is the name of the REITs as well as the category they're in and their ticker symbols. So starting at the left here, we have Allied Properties, Granite REIT, Cap REIT, Killam REIT, Northview REIT, RealCan, Smart Centers, and then H&R REIT. Unfortunately, the last one here to the right being Northwest Health Properties in the healthcare real estate sector did not yet have their Q2 numbers released so I couldn't include them in this video but if you are interested in me actually reviewing this one once their numbers are out let me know down in the comments and I'd be happy to do so. I'd also like to add before we actually dive into all the specific numbers here that if you did watch my previous video doing a very similar comparison of the REIT industry in Canada, well since then I've added a couple data elements that are very relevant to the current market environment such as percentage of rent collected in the second quarter of 2020, acquisition of properties and indebtedness ratio. The reason why I decided to add these data points is because the main fear among investors in Q1 moving into Q2 in regards to real estate investment trust was rent not being collected at an optimal level and therefore having severely truncated revenue figures. And finally, the last piece of preliminary data is that all the numbers we're going to be looking at here are for the second quarter 2020 only as opposed to what we did last time, which was the entire 2019 calendar year. Okay, so for this video, we're going to start off to the left with allied properties and slowly move forward to the left. All the way to H and R REIT at the end of this video. And the first category here is the actual price point right now relative to the February peak. So Allied Properties being an office building specific REIT with office buildings in the large metropolitan area such as Toronto, Montreal, and Edmonton had a February peak of $60 a share. And the current price point at the time of filming this video is $39.85, which is a fall of $20.15 or 33.58%. And due to the fact that they have not actually cut their dividend, the yield has reflected up to 4.14% right now. Due to the market environment, I decided to include this section right here where it was talk of cutting dividends. So this is just based on what I could find. Has the real estate investment trust actually spoken about cutting the dividend? And in the case of allied properties, as of right now, management has not spoken about cutting the dividend just yet. Let's now look at the Q2 financials. So for this quarter, allied properties had revenues of $136.6 million. In this quarter, the actual revenues have grown by almost 16%, which considering the fact that in the previous video, we had seen that Morningstar was forecasting their annual revenue growth to be negative 6%. This is a very nice revenue growth that we're seeing right now. The cost of revenues was negative 59.2 million with a net operating income of 83.3 million. Now, interestingly in this quarter, or not so surprisingly, actually the gain on sale of security section being any of these REITs offloading properties and making a gain off of this is basically a zero or very minimal for some of these companies because they have not actually been offloading any properties. In the case of Allied Properties, it is $0 in this quarter and this would have had an impact on total net income. But right now for this quarter, we're looking at total net income of $93 million. Now, if you have watched any of my previous videos speaking about real estate investment trust though, you would know that a proper metric for assessing the actual financial viability of a REIT is the funds from operations because this pretty much only takes into account 
account the actual rental revenue being derived from their tenants rather than gain on sale of security, which is not reoccurring and high quality income for a real estate investment trust. So in the case of Allied Properties for Q2, we're looking at $68.6 million at a funds from operation per share in this quarter specifically of 0.557. The distributions per share for the quarter were 41 cents per share, which translates over to a forward looking distribution to FFO of 74%, which is in the realm of a healthy dividend payout ratio for a real estate investment trust. And by the way, a distribution to FFO is basically the same thing as a dividend payout ratio for a regular dividend stock. So what we're seeing right now for Allied Properties is actually quite positive. Nice revenue growth, despite the fact that we were thinking there would be highly truncated revenues. Let's actually now speak about the percentage of rent collected. So this is 94.5% of all rent collected in Q2 2020, which considering the fact that many companies have people working at home right now, uh, this is actually a very nice percentage of rent being collected. And during this quarter, the company has not actually even been stagnant. They have been acquiring properties in the the likes of $205 million worth of properties during this period. They currently have $72.4 million in cash and cash equivalents and their dividends paid during this quarter were $50.78 million. So due to the fact that their revenues are still growing at a nice pace and their percentage of rent collected is still quite high, I'm not necessarily worried that Allied Properties is going to be cutting their dividend anytime soon, especially since we're now moving out of the worst period in my opinion for potential lost rental revenue. Revenues. Total current assets are 165.38 million and their total current liabilities are 316 million. So this is something that actually across the board here, we've seen a lot of these real estate investment trusts take on more levels of short-term debt in order to maintain their dividend yield and just in case something happened where they were at a very large loss of rental income. Now in terms of their total assets and total liabilities, we're looking at $9.1 billion in total assets and $3.1 billion in total liabilities for a total ratio of 2.9%. However, even this for a real estate investment trust, these typically have a much higher level of debt to their total assets due to the fact that they just take on high levels of mortgage debt in order to finance their properties. So this is not necessarily something that worries me at all for allied properties at 2.9. And finally, in terms of the actual value of this company right now. So the industry average price to FFO right now that I've calculated is roughly 15.3%. And just by the way, the price to FFO is basically price to earnings ratio for a regular company, but this is related to a real estate investment trust because again, we learned earlier that a funds from operation is much more relevant when assessing the financial viability of a REIT. So current price to FFO projected over the next calendar year of allied properties is around 17.88%. So even though it's still at a 33% fall since February peaks, in contrast to the industry average, it's actually still trading at a higher multiple than what the industry is trading at. All right, so now that we've gone through all the data for allied properties, I think it's safe to assume that this isn't all that complicated as I had mentioned earlier. So we're gonna be going through all the other ones at a much more rapid pace. And if you wanna take the time to actually look at all this data here, feel free to just pause the video or take a screenshot, whatever works for you and do your analysis at your own pace. So the next one is Granite REIT, which is an industrial REIT that owns and operates warehouses and other forms of real estate in the industrial sector. The February price point was $74.86 and the current price is $75.96 for a current fall of negative $1.1, meaning it's actually gone up in value since the February peak and the fall is negative 1.47%. In this case, that means it's appreciated by 1.47% and their current dividend yield is 3.82%. Now, the reason why this REIT has performed so well is because of the nature of the real estate being industrial where the majority of their tenants would not ever be in a position of defaulting on their payments because they've been up and operational during this entire period of the medical situation, meaning that right here, as we're seeing, they've collected 99% of their rent in Q2 2020. Revenue was 81 million for the quarter at a super nice 19.29% year over year revenue growth, and we're looking at total net income of 177 million. This REIT's also been extremely aggressive with their acquisitions at 330. $31 million for acquisitions of properties in the quarter. And they have a very 
nice cash and cash equivalent position of $617 million. This has been bolstered tremendously since Q1 even. And considering the fact that they only paid $38.9 million in dividends over the quarter, this company is not in any position where they're going to be cutting their dividend anytime soon. Current ratio is also 6.71%, which demonstrates that in the short term, they have significantly more assets than liabilities coming up. And same thing for their total ratio at a very nice 2.6 total ratio. Now their funds from operation 53.5 million for an FFO per share of 0.97 and a distribution to FFO forward being 75%, which once again is very standard and typical for a REIT and nothing to worry about. With that said though, due to the price point, it is actually trading significantly higher than the industry average price to FFO at 19.577. But due to the nature of this company, honestly, I still see this as a great growth stock to invest in with a nice dividend yield at the same time. I personally have a nice position in Granite REIT and I think it's going to continue appreciating over the long term. Okay, so we're now moving on to the next category of REITs being the residential REITs. And these real estate investment trusts were also projected to have truncated revenues by Morningstar as of the last video, but now obviously there is no more forecasted annual revenue growth. And honestly, these REITs performed a lot better than most people were assuming from a rent collection standpoint. So we'll start with CAP REIT, which is the ticker symbol car.un. It is still down at 22.47% and the current dividend yield is 2.90%. So even though this is actually the lowest one on the list today, 2.90% dividend yield is still nice for any portfolio. Revenue figures of 2.19 million for the quarter at a revenue growth year over year for Q2 of just under 15% and a total net income here of 61.7 million, which actually even surprises me to a certain standpoint. I was expecting this to be more in the like 90 to 95% range, but this is definitely nice to see. And they've also been acquiring properties as well during this period at $51 million worth of properties being purchased. CapRead also has $213 million in cash and cash equivalents. They have not spoken at all about cutting their dividend payment and they only paid $45 million in dividend payments during Q2. So based on their cash position and their total current assets, as well as the fact that their revenue is coming in nicely at 98%, I really don't think that we're going to be seeing this dividend being cut anytime soon. Their current ratio is quite low right now at 0.30, which is definitely something that you'll want to keep an eye on. But considering everything else that I just just mentioned, I don't necessarily think that this company is in trouble at all. It's one of the largest Canadian REITs and again, 98% of rental revenue coming in, not something that worries me too much. Now their distribution to FFO is also among the lowest on the list here at 63%, which is nice to see and further solidifies my point that I don't think this company is going to be cutting dividends anytime soon. Now, finally, in terms of valuation though, the current price to FFO of a cap REIT is 21.556 right now compared to industry average of 15.30. This is significantly higher, even though it's still at a position of being down 22% since the February peak. Moving on to the next one, we have a Killiam REIT, which is still currently down 23% at a nice dividend yield of 3.79%. Now they have not spoken about cutting their dividend either. And unfortunately though, they did not provide a figure of the percent of rent collected in Q2 2020. But due to the fact that it is residential, and if we compare it to Cap REIT and Northview, which both have a very nice percentage of rent being collected, I would assume that it's in the same sort of ballpark, so nothing necessarily really to worry about. However, what is more worrisome for Killam REIT is their cash and cash equivalents, which are 2.73 million and their dividends paid for the quarter were $13.4 million and their total current assets are very low at 29.1 compared to their total current liabilities at $302 million. So in my opinion, from this entire list here, if there's one REIT that's going to be cutting their dividend yield anytime soon, it would most likely be this one just based on their cash position and their total current assets relative to the dividends that they've paid out. With that said, distribution to funds from operation was quite low at 65%. So who knows, this company might continue maintaining their dividend yield moving forward at 3.79, which is very nice for any portfolio. The next residential REIT is Northview REIT, ticker symbol NVU.UN. And surprisingly, it is only down 5.37% from its February peak and subsequently has a nice yield of 4.70%. Now the revenue growth year over year from 
Q2 2019 is only 0.71%, which is still better than the retail REITs. However, nothing compared to the other ones that we previously mentioned, even in the residential sector. Their percentage of rent collected at 98.4% is definitely very positive, so nothing really to complain there. However, their cash and cash equivalents, as well as total current assets at 37.1 million, are extremely low in my opinion compared to the dividends paid out in the quarter and their total current liabilities, placing their total current ratio at 0.05, which is extremely low. Moving down the list, we're now at the retail real estate investment trusts being RioCan and Smart Centers that I've included in this spreadsheet because of the two main retail real estate investment trusts in Canada. Now, these ones are still the ones that are the most hit from an actual percentage standpoint, being down 43.47% and 35.35% since the February price points. And for this reason, their dividend yields, which have not yet been cut at all, are very high in the 9.19% and 8. 0.85% range. It goes without saying that retail real estate was by far hit the hardest because many of their tenants were forced to temporarily shut down for many months and have now been actually shut down permanently due to the fact that they weren't able to stay afloat during this extended period of business shutdown. So percentage of rent collected for RioCan is 85% and I'm actually not going to go through all the numbers for RioCan because I've done an extremely in-depth analysis of the Q2 numbers for RioCan that you can check out right here. I'm including a link up top. So we're going to actually look at smart centers for this one right here. The revenue growth year over year for smart centers was negative 3.28%. And this is really due to the fact that only 77.8% of their rent was collected for Q2. So it's very normal that even though they're purchasing more properties, the rent is actually below last year because we're seeing almost 25% less rent being collected on their same properties. Now, the reason why I highlighted these two in red right here for the total net income of Rio Can and smart centers is because their revenue was not actually negative 350 and negative 133 million. This is basically just a paper loss where the actual net fair value of the real estate properties have gone down significantly for the quarter. They didn't actually lose hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. This is strictly due to the fact that in terms of their overall portfolio, the value of these properties has gone down in net fair market value. And once again, I've spoken about this in detail in the real can Q2 analysis video and basically the reason for this and what's to come in the future for this type of situation. So make sure to check it out if you haven't already. Now, surprisingly, even though the percentage of rent collected for smart centers was 77%, it has still been quite aggressive on their acquisitions at $107.6 million in acquisitions of properties. And I put this number in blue because for smart centers, most of their acquisitions are actually in the residential side of things. So even though this is a retail focused real estate investment, trust management has actually mentioned in their letter to shareholders that they're looking to expand more in the residential real estate because residential is really where it's at right now for real estate in Canada as the population is growing and people need a place to live so management looking at their overall portfolio they're seeing that okay maybe the retail sector is going downhill somewhat if it's not for essential companies and businesses like grocery stores etc well we should actually expand into either industrial or residential which Rio can and smart center are both doing. With that said, Smart Centers has not spoken about cutting their dividend anytime soon, meaning that their dividend yield right now is very nice and could be a great addition to any dividend portfolio. And considering the fact that they spend $79 million on dividends in the quarter and have $532 million in cash and cash equivalents, this may or may not be a company that will be cutting their dividends in the future due to the fact that they have 77% of rent collected. This is definitely something that you'll have to keep an eye on if you decide to invest in Smart Centers. Another element to mention is that their distributions to funds from operation looking forward in the coming 12 months is 105%, which is quite high. And finally, the last REIT that we're going to be looking at here is H&R REIT, which operates in a variety of different types of real estate, being office, retail, and residential. So this is by far the most diversified real estate investment trust on today's list. The ticker symbol is HR.UN, and it is currently still down 
52.21%, making it the largest fall since February price points of all the other REITs in Canada. And their current dividend yield is 6.66%, despite the fact that they already cut their dividend distributions by 50% in the second quarter. Revenues for the REIT at $270 million is down 5.96% year over year for Q2 2019. And their percentage of rent collected in Q2 was actually surprisingly quite high though at 89% due to the fact that their residential and office spaces were at 97, 98%. I looked at this further in their actual earnings report. It's really the retail side of things that was looking at around a 70% collection rate. Nonetheless, the company has still been acquiring more properties at $37.6 million invested in the quarter, mainly in residential and industrial properties only, obviously nothing in retail. I really hope that this Excel comparison containing all the relevant financial data for each one of these eight main REITs in Canada has helped you better visualize why some of these REITs are doing better than others and whether or not the dividend yield and price point right now is justified. Obviously, you can't really treat all these REITs the same and compare them on a one-to-one -one basis because the reality is that they all operate and own different types of real estate, some of them being more exposed to others to what's going on from a whole business shutdown standpoint. But in my opinion, with most retailers being back up and running, for retail-focused REITs specifically, I think that most of the damage is behind us, specifically being contained in Q2. During Q1, the largest fear was really just massive rental defaults, but as we can see, even during Q2, where there were the most businesses shut down in the retail space, the worst hit read from a rent collection standpoint was Smart Centers at 77.8% of rents collected in Q2, which don't get me wrong, is still quite massive, but could have been much worse. And as we're going into Q3, this percentage of rent collection is gradually going back up into the 80% range. One thing I do find quite interesting concerning the retail focused REITs such as Rio Can and Smart Centers is that in their letter to shareholders in their forward looking information, they are putting a larger emphasis on the fact that they're going to be purchasing more residential and industrial properties in the future. And for their current retail focused spaces, they're going to be focusing on acquiring more consumer defensive tenants such as Walmart, Superstores and other forms of grocery stores that are going to remain open regardless of any form of medical situation in the future or this type of economic shutdown. Just like any other type of business, real estate investment trusts need to adapt and mold to the ever-changing market environment, and the REITs featured in this video really seem to be aware of this reality, with management refocusing their future business operations. Based on how everything's played out as of now in Q3, and considering the current market environment, in my opinion, a handful of these REITs are in great position to continue maintaining their dividend yield, especially for the industrial and residential REITs that have rent collections in the 90% range and even for other retail focused REITs like RioCan, I really believe that this company is completely undervalued right now and will continue maintaining their near 10% dividend yield. So make sure to conduct your own research on each one of the REITs that interests you most that were featured in this video. But over the long run and considering the current Canadian real estate market, I think that a lot of these REITs are going to provide your portfolio for both nice appreciation long term as well as nice dividend income. So what do you personally think of the whole real estate investment trust market in Canada as well as each one? of these individual reads, make sure to let me know down in the comments. I'd love to know your thoughts and opinions. And if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to smash the like button. It really helps the channel out and consider subscribing for more industry comparison, company analysis, and just overall stock market investing topics. Hit the bell button so that you're notified whenever I release a new piece of content. And on that note, thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next one.